sorry for this slide, but it's an important one. It's an important one because it, it, it says something rather incredible, which all of you, I think, will appreciate when I get through with this. Uh, here's the mitochondria over here. And for every ATP generated by the mitochondria, you make superoxide, one for one. You consume nutrients and oxygen, and then you generate ATP, and you, from there you generate superoxide, which is converted by S to D and GPX into water. You also produce CO2. So what's coming into the system is oxygen and nutrition, and what's exiting the system is ATP, water, and CO2, and that's really good. <coughs> as long as you're doing that. Over here is nitric oxide produced by INOS, INOS, and ENOS. This is called nitric oxide synthetase. It's an enzyme present in different cells, and it produces copious amounts when activated nitric oxide. It's produced by calcium. Calcium actually rushes in the cell and activates as a signaling factor for INOS, NNOS, and ENOS. INOS is found in the immune system, in the immune cell, and it's turned on when the immune cell sees or perceives an infectious process. INOS is turned on, it's called, it stands for immune or inducible. It's turned on by cytokines in the presence of microbes, mold toxins, and allergens. So microbes, mold toxins, and allergens trigger INOS. You might ask, which one of those triggers the most INOS? Microbes, mold toxins, or allergens? Which would you guess? Actually, just allergies produce the most INOS activation. Probably more than toxins, mold toxins, or viruses. INOS is produced in the neuron, and it's mediated by the NMDA receptor. And INOS is activated by the act of thinking, by the act of emoting, or having an emotional response, or by smelling chemicals up your nose. So if you think too hard, emote too hard, or smell something bad, you generate a lot of INOS, which in turn generates a lot of nitric oxide in the brain. And down here, uh, ENOS is primarily activated by VEGF. And by the way, VEGF levels have been measured in CFIS patients, and guess what? They're very high. Because ve VEGF, a peptide, is transcribed by any cell that is hypoxic or not getting enough blood. Think about that. VEGF is, is, is spit out by the cell in its attempt to receive what it is not getting, namely oxygen. VEGF is what actually causes permeable, permeable gut. It's the underlying mechanism. But this, of course, is involved in microcirculation, or really the lack of it. The lack of microcirculation is what turns on ENOS. It is also turned on in penile erections. In fact, you're looking at the cause of the penile erection right here. And this is where Viagra works. So, if you didn't have nitric oxide, you would have no immune response. You could not think, emote, and you could have no sex. That's what nitric oxide does for you. Also, nitric oxide is important for memory. Uh, nitric oxide is actually the molecule most responsible for memory. But So you can bet your bottom dollar that inside of any cell, if you're operating properly, in the cells for which nitric oxide is critical, like the brain, like the immune system, and like microcirculation, you make a lot of it. I'm guar I guarantee you, you do. Especially if you're having allergies or an infection, or having sex, or thinking a lot, or emoting a lot, or smelling chemicals a lot. You're producing a lot of this stuff. But look over here. Uh, how much superoxide is outside the mitochondria? Under normal circumstances, almost none. You'll notice where the locus of control is. If you have a lot of molecules of this sitting out there and very few of these, then the amount of proxy nitrate is limited, is basically limited by the smaller of the two numbers. You can make no more proxy nitrate than the smaller of the two numbers. So the locus of control under normal circumstances lies over here. So you can have all the infections you wish to have, all the sex you wish to have, all of the thinking you wish to conduct, all the smells you like to smell, bad and good, and you're not really in trouble from the point of view of this. Trouble occurs when something breaks down over here because of this coupling 
this important coupling action. Um, <clears throat> what we think is happening is that there's something that goes wrong with the SOD GPX system. And we know, for one thing we know, is that SOD and GPX are target enzymes for mercury. Again, going back to cardiomyopathy, the strongest evidence of causality that we have in the published medical literature for cardiomyopathy is, in fact, mercury. And this is a target area for mercury because SOD is a zinc, copper, and or manganese uh, dependent enzyme, and GPX is a selenium dependent enzyme. And these cations can be replaced by mercury that competes them out and degrades the system. As a result, if you continue to try to make more ATP at the same level you were, you cannot convert superoxide to water and it begins to rattle around in there and some of it leaks out. And then you begin to make proxynitrite and then you're in trouble. And notice that the locus of control, should this number go high, is it switches over here because you're limited by the, uh, by the, by the lowest number. So if five went to five million, your locus of control would be over here. So the, this is important. The first manifestation of disordered mitochondrial function might not necessarily be what you think. The first manifestation of dysfunction will be when you get a viral infection. And you'll swear to God, that's when it started. But in fact, the only way a virus infection could really cream you like this would be if you had an underlying energy problem in the first place. Dr. when the laser is next to the mic, it creates Okay. Going back to our original idea of phase one, <coughs> uh, phase one uh, RNA cell inhibition of mitochondria, phase two xenobiotic inhibition of mitochondria, and finally, in certain conditions of mitochondrial dysfunction in which superoxide cannot be adequately taken care of, uh, <coughs> you can then generate uh, phase three with significant vulnerability, I believe, of, of the heart. Proxynitrite <coughs> as a free radical probably ultimately kills us. And, but because it degrades cellular function and probably leads to, in early life, either suicide or cardiomyopathy like I had, later in life, coronary disease and cancer, and then last in life, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. But there is no way out of this. You can think of it as free radical as the power that's pushing you toward death. Which way you die depends on genetic factors, environmental influences, and chance, and chance alone. In the case of chronic fatigue syndrome, by a feedback inhibition effect, by feedback inhibition, as this is produced, this could bring energy production down to where you could then take this all to water. You'll bring your locus of control back to here. You'll stop making proxynitrate, but you'll equilibrate at a low level. The result of that is that chronic fatigue syndrome turns out to be a disorder that saves your life. By bringing down energy levels to a point where you can, you can satisfy the requirements to, to not let these two molecules come into contact with each other. And that will work for a long time and perhaps for all of your life, unless, of course, the vasoconstrictive nature of the defense to cardiomyopathy, which could be a present in some people, could cause the ischemia reperfusion injury, which could then come into play and make you really sick. Some of the defenses against proxynitrite, turns out the biggest defense against proxynitrite is carbon dioxide, one of the products of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria produces the very thing that needs, you need the most to defend yourself against the thing that you don't want to create when you make energy, so to speak. One of the interesting thing is, things is that what, if CO2 is your major defense, then how could you increase CO2? you would stop breathing. You would slow your breathing down. So the best way to defend against some of this, this oxidant stress, as it were, is to slow down your breathing. The worst thing you could do is speed up your breathing. Now, <clears throat> under what conditions do human beings 
naturally speed up their breathing rates, which would bring down your CO2 and expose you to this. No, well, exercise does bring, raise breathing rates, but also increases acid. Uh, what it is, is altitude. So when you go up in airplanes, what altitude are you? You're about 7,000 feet pressurized, even though it's at 30. And you're going to, on that basis alone, hyperventilate because you're in a low oxygen environment. And sitting in a chair, don't no less, which could significantly impact you. Has anyone had trouble flying? Because this is one of the one of the mechanisms. The other mechanism is when a low pressure front comes through. When a low pressure front comes through and you drop your pressure, you have less oxygen in the pressure, so you compensate by breathing faster. The breathing faster takes away your defense so that areas of inflammation, such as joint pain, will get worse when the low pressure systems come through. 